Thank you. Uh, yes, um, thanks for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I'm just going to present one case report, which I think encapsulates the work that I do in Aberystwyth. Uh, first of all, very briefly, an idea of uh, what we do. Uh, we are a post-mortem diagnostic service for farm vets and to provide uh, government uh, animal disease surveillance, monitor for notifiable disease, and also monitor farm animal welfare. So to get to the case history uh, that I'd like to present today, this was a flock of 180 hogs, and by that I mean ewe lambs that haven't been bred, and barren ewes that were put on hill land above the Elan Valley, um, and clinical signs began to appear about six weeks later. And these included dyspnea, lethargy, and lateral recumbency, and also six animals were found dead by the farmer at that time. So we did have one of the dead animals in for post-mortem. Uh, splenomegaly and lymphadenopathy were the only things that were obvious there. And this was an indication of tick, tick bone disease because we'd seen this sort of thing previously. And you can see in this photograph from a previous case, a previous investigation, a five-month-old lamb, and the spleen has been placed on the abomasum here, and you can see the size of this is, is very large indeed. So the laboratory test that we did uh, for this, the brain was unavailable because the animal had been shot prior to transport. Uh, the spleen was taken for PCR, sent to the Morden Research Institute for Anaplasma phagocytophilum, which is the causal organism of tick-borne fever, and the result was positive, which we expected. Uh, uh, then we had a second animal the following day, and by this time uh, there were more animals found dead, and we agreed to uh, take a live submission in this case just to see uh, the, the clinical signs of the live animal. And again, lethargy, uh, dyspnea, and lateral recumbency, and minimal post-mortem findings again in this case. So gross pathology wasn't giving us any indication of, of the cause of the high mortality. Um, blood, a blood sample was taken before euthanasia <coughs> of this animal, and I'll come back to that later because it is important. The brain was, uh, we managed to fix the brain for histology from this case and also some other samples. So the PCR again was positive uh, on the blood sample this time, the heparin blood sample at the recommendation of Mara Rocky at the uh, Morden Research Institute. Uh, histology, though, uh, indicated, or the morphological diagnosis on histology was delayed swayback, which threw us a bit. Um, swayback is uh, a copper deficiency, usually seen in animals of about two to four months old, and you can get a delayed version later in animals of this sort of age. So the questions that we had, could swayback be the cause of the high mortality, the increasing mortality, even though they'd been taken off the hill? And uh, was there another reason for the high mortality? And uh, what other possible causes uh, should we be investigating? So this was pretty much answered a week later, and by now 45 animals had died. And again, uh, post-mortem findings were minimal, and the, the tick-borne fever PCR was again positive. But the histology indicated a polioencephalomyelitis typical of louping ill. Now, uh, my histology is a bit rusty, but what we have here is infiltration of lymphocytes and inflammatory cells around a blood vessel, these red arrows, um, and you get this in either uh, louping ill, encephalitis, or listeriosis. And you also get this neuronal degeneration. So, Lauping ill is a flavivirus, uh, morbidity and mortality between 5 and 60%, and it is neurotropic and causes this uh, polioencephalomyelitis. So we were then able to retrospectively go back to the samples that we'd already sent to the Morden. Um, the spleen, uh, we were able to do a PCR for LIV, Lauping ill virus, which was positive, and the serology from the animal that I post-mortemed indicated the presence of IgM and IgG um, against Lauping ill virus. So 
we were also able to back this up with immunohistochemistry, which was performed by Toby Floyd at the APHA in Adelstone. LIV antigen was detected in the brain of HOG2, and if you remember, this was the one where the morphological diagnosis was delayed sway back. And LIV antigen was also present in HOG3. So this is an illustration. Uh, the brown stained areas are uh, LIV antigen, stained immunohistochemistry in the brain tissue of the third animal, and the appearance was similar in the second animal. I haven't got pictures of that, I'm afraid. So the pathogenesis then, um, anaplasma causes a leukopenia and uh, re reduces the number of circulating lymphocytes and neutrophils and predisposed, in this case, to LIV viremia, and the neurotropism produced a rapidly fatal polioencephalomyelitis. Um, so TBF and LIV co-infection was the likely cause of the high mortality, and by the end, 53 of this group of animals had died. So what I would say, comments in conclusion then, really, is the importance of expertise in large animal pathology and specialist laboratory backup to, to be able to conduct these investigations, and also the, ex the experience to question laboratory findings in the first place so that a, a diagnosis can be reached. And to continue this service, government support is required and, of course, in these times, is quite difficult. I just thank my colleagues, Beverly Hopkins and Mark Wessels for his histopathology, Mara Rocky at the Morden Research Institute and Toby Floyd. And also Amanda Carson, who is our liaison with the Animal and Plant Health Agency, and Christian Glossop, CVO for Wales, for her support. Thank you.